Welcome, welcome. Get settled in and we'll get started in one minute. Okay, welcome everybody to the Travis Audubon Virtual Membership Meeting and Speaker Series. My name is Nicole Netherton. I'm the Executive Director of Travis Audubon and I'm so glad you've decided to join us tonight. I'm actually glad we're not meeting in person because I think the storm is gonna move through while we are talking tonight. If you are a member of Travis Audubon, thank you so much for your continued support. And if you're not yet a member, I hope you'll join us. You can go to the membership page on our website, which is travisaudubon.org. A few exciting announcements for this evening. We were honored this morning with a proclamation by council member Allison Alter and the rest of the city council celebrating Austin's status as an official bird city. It was a really exciting thing that happened today. I wanted to give a special thanks to uh, Travis Audubon program manager, Kaylee Zazula and board member John Bloomfield for all their hard work in coordinating the application as well as uh, friends and partners at the city of Austin and Travis County Watershed Protection and Austin Water. Uh, it was a real uh, team effort and we're excited about this achievement and I hope that it will encourage all of our neighbors to explore birds and nature even more in our city. Birdathon is in full swing right now and there are still spots left on some great trips coming up over the next couple of weeks. And as you may know, this will align with the peak of migration in our area. It's a great time to be out birding. So take a look at our calendar and join us. It's the best time of year to be out there. And we've already exceeded our fundraising goal. And now we're just about $2,000 away from uh, $50,000. So if you haven't donated yet, help us get uh, even higher in that fundraising goal. Um, next week, a week from tonight on April 27th, we are having our Birdathon party. It will be in person at our offices at 3908 Avenue B. And we are going to have a fabulous presentation by Bruce Beeler about Godwits as well as a delicious dinner. You can register for the dinner. It's $10 per person when you register online or 15 at the door. So go ahead and register in advance so that we can include you in our headcount. And we will have vegan and gluten-free options available. So we hope to see you next week. It'll be a really fun party. Finally, we have our Moonlit Migrations event coming up on May 5th and it sold out really quickly, but we have amazing merch that we're gonna have in our store after the party. And we also have raffle tickets that are available for purchase online. So you can find out more on our website. And last but not least, I want to ask you to save the date for our annual Migratory Bird Day celebration at Hornsby Bend, which will take place on Saturday, May 13th. We'll have lots of fun, family-friendly activities in store, so I hope you will join us then. So we are ready to get started. I thank you in advance for muting your microphone and turning off your camera just to minimize distractions. You can enter your questions in the chat and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of our meeting. And you can look for the recording of this session on our YouTube channel after we're done. So it's now my pleasure to welcome my friend, Travis Audubon board member and amazing ornithologist, Rich Kostecki to introduce our speaker. Hi, Rich. Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad you can make it tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Chris Murray. Uh, he's a wildlife management biologist uh, at Austin Bergstrom International Airport uh, in the Airside Operations Division. Uh, and you may you know, be wondering, you know, why would the airport have a biologist? Well, he oversees the efforts to minimize risk to aircraft operations, airport structures, equipment, and human health posed by populations of wildlife on and around the airport. Uh, he also facilitates training for airport employees works with stakeholders on reporting wildlife strikes to the FAA uh, and reviews proposed land uses that may attract wildlife. Um, I haven't, you know, I'm really interested to see, uh, hear what he has to say. I know in other parts of the US, uh, wildlife at airports has been a really big issue. Uh, you know, either airports, uh, you know, the, how they're designed create habitat that attract certain species uh, are they're placed by uh, adjacent habitats uh, where there's a lot of wildlife that could potentially uh, 
interfere with uh, air traffic. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to you know hear what's going on uh, here in Austin locally. Um, welcome, Chris. Yes, good evening. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, definitely uh, grateful to be here with you all this evening. I don't. I work more in a operations and management kind of standpoint, so I don't get to speak to uh, conservation groups all too much. So definitely grateful for the opportunity. Let me try to get my uh, PowerPoint presentation going. Are you all able to see the PowerPoint? Is it visible? Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, I, from the introduction, I'm the biologist here at Austin Bergstrom. I'm going to go through sort of some things, a, a basic introduction here about wildlife at the airport. I'm going to go more generally into hazards presented by wildlife at airports, uh, a little bit on bird mammal identification at AUS. Uh, I, AUS is just sort of the three letter abbreviation for Austin Bergstrom, so I'll use that interchangeably. Uh, then we're going to go into wildlife management techniques and tools, some of the trends we're seeing at the airport, and then I'm going to close out with an overview of the airport wildlife management plan since it sort of summarizes everything that we talk about. So um, this is probably probably kind of uh, common information to y'all, but uh, Travis County, if you look here, I made my best attempt to circle that in red, is uh, right at sort of the converging point of three different ecoregions in Texas, areas that are similar in terms of the uh, plant species and wildlife species that you'll see. So that in part sor sort of explains the um, abundance and diversity of the wildlife, including the birds you'll see here at in Travis County and Austin, Bro Austin Bergstrom Airport and, uh, specifically. So we have a number of what we have worked with the FAA, uh, Federal Avi Aviation Administration, to identify as wildlife attractants uh, on and around the airport. The first one is Onion Creek. If you look at some aerial views of the airport, I have some coming up here in a moment. Onion Creek sort of forms the south border of the airport where it goes by some park features and then it flows uh, towards the Colorado where it ultimately forms a confluence of the Colorado River. Uh, it's known for its flooding, I believe. Uh, it was a little before my time in Austin, but I think 2015 was the last major flood down there. But it's a, a fairly significant water source with all the riparian areas uh, and um, some of the parks that I mentioned a moment ago, uh, pretty close to the airport. That does uh, flow into the Colorado River, which is a major uh, drainage feature here in the state of Texas. In fact, if you look at the drainage map here, it catches uh, the, the stormwater or drainage catchment basin goes all the way to the uh, eastern portion of the state of New Mexico. Of course, Lady Bird Lake, as we call it, is sort of an impoundment or reservoir feature on the Colorado River. And if you've ever spent some time down there, there's definitely a lot of wildlife. You can see uh, all kinds of things. There's some uh, bald eagle nests that we've been tracking down there from time to time. But otherwise, yeah, major water source as far as the airport goes, basically right at our front door. I think about 75% of the drainage area of the airport flows towards Onion Creek, about the other 25% flows towards the uh, Colorado River. Right on the banks of the Colorado River, and I think you mentioned this earlier, is the environment Center for Environmental Research at, Research at Hornsby Bend. A number of different operations going on there, primarily a wastewater treatment plant. There's uh, some hay cutting, a lot of research that goes on there, compost operations, and I think some more things are being added all the time. But that's, if, if you spend some time over there, a major bird habitat, northern shoveler ducks, I think you can see about three or 400 of them at the right time around November or so. Uh, I've had a few, I'm getting a little ahead, bit ahead of myself, but we've had a few wildlife strikes as best we can figure right in close proximity with it. Some Franklin gulls, uh, some sort of short and type waiting, uh, waiting birds. And then while we're talking about attractants to the airport, there's also so, sort of the airport itself. Um, we have about 1,268 vegetated acres of landscape within the airport operations area or AOA, which is simply put sort of the area inside the security fences. And that's not even, in, we probably have close to as much wooded or undeveloped land um, outside the fences that the airport still owns. Uh, some of the pavement there, aircraft hangars, we were a military base right up to the late nineties. So a lot of those buildings are abandoned. You know, you start talking about roosting locations for birds 
uh, the garages, some of the fringe of the terminal is all kind of uh, potential habitat for different birds at different times of the year. Uh, switching gears here a little bit. So I've mentioned sort of where we are, our location, what's unique about it. Let's start talking about actual hazards presented by wildlife at airports. And the trend is an increasing one, both in terms of more birds and larger birds, birds of a larger biomass uh, when it comes to the aircraft bird strike uh, trends. Uh, modern commercialized jets are designed to withstand a single four pound bird and jet turbines can operate after ingesting, which is sort of the textbook term for sucking in a uh, one and a half pound bird. So the risks will go up considerably when you start exceeding those tolerances um, by the biomass of a single bird or collectively by a flock of birds, right? And here's a, here's a few statistics to back that up. Some of this data is getting a little bit dated. I think the FAA is going to release some more information in a little while, but over 250 been, people have actually been killed worldwide as a result of uh, bird strikes since 1988. About 13,795 wildlife strikes reported for U.S. civil aviation aircraft in the calendar year of 2015. About 4,300 bird strikes were reported by the U.S. Air Force in the year of 2012, and the general consensus is the military probably underreports their strikes. And I'm going to go a little bit into uh, strike reporting later on here. 1990 to 2015 was an intensive study period. During that time, there was actually over 160,000 bird strikes on UV U.S. aircraft. Uh, here's a few few, few illustrations: uh, an ingested cormorant uh, into a MD-80 engine. In this image, here is a uh, ahead of myself, a pintail duck strike on the uh, windscreen of this smaller uh, general aviation type aircraft. And uh, as much noise and as air as, a uh, air as a helicopter displaces while it's in flight, uh, even, even uh, though they can be involved in strikes. Here's a crane strike on a military aircraft, a military helicopter, excuse me. I'm not sure the species. And then here's sort of the event that got the issue in front of people. Uh, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 back in uh, 2009. Uh, once this happened, the issue of potential bird strikes, the risk management aspect of that sort of went before Congress, the TSA, some branches of the military, and uh, other agencies as well. And that's sort of what created positions like mine. So now you'll find a lot of airports that have a wildlife biologist specific to the airport or someone operating in a um, sort of like a contract capacity with a private company or the USDA actually manages a lot of airport wildlife management positions at different airports. Uh, they created the movie Sully, followed that uh, in 2016, which I have actually yet to see. Here's some uh, trends here for the people that uh, like the sort of the graphical interpretation of it. 1990 to 2015, you can see here a number of reported bird strikes in blue with your terrestrial mammals, bats, and reptiles all lumped together in red, as you can see clearly an increasing trend over that duration of time. Not quite as clear of an upward trend, but altogether some pretty high numbers. What you're seeing here uh, is reported bird strikes resulting in damage with uh, birds and then terrestrial mammals, bats, and reptiles in another category. And I think they will be coming up with some new data in the near future, so be interested to see where things have been going. And then there's the economic aspect of it, which is very important. Uh, aircraft, airports all operate on synchronized schedules and alterations. Aircraft downtime can essentially be very costly. So to cite the research here, 68 strikes resulted in a destroyed aircraft from that study period I referenced a moment ago, 1990 to 2015. And the annual cost of uh, strikes to the US civil aviation industry in 2015 was projected to be a minimum of 69,497 hours of aircraft downtime and almost 230 million in direct and other monetary losses. Now this can get a little tricky as depending what you count as part of that loss structure, but overall these numbers are uh, probably on the low side. Actual losses are likely much higher. So I think it's interesting to also look at where are strikes actually occurring with uh, relativity to uh, where the aircraft is operating. Well, at ground level, AGL, as it's uh, abbreviated here on the screen, uh, that's already, when the aircraft is in contact with the ground, you're already accounting for 41% of strikes. If you set your reference window from ground level up to 500 feet above ground level, you're accounting for about 71% 70, of strikes. 
ground level up to 1500 feet above ground level is about 82 percent of strikes and put uh, another way here uh, from what's on the slide here about only about eight percent of strikes actually occur above 35,000 feet so definitely a correlation with uh, proximity to ground level now we're going to talk a little bit about strike reports. This is a really important aspect of what we do. We spend a lot of time uh, training people on this, disseminating some strike collection kits, and the FAA has invested a lot into trying to get accurate data. Strike reports are very important. The official form is called a 5200-7 FAA bird or wildlife strike report. It's all online now. There was a day when it's on paper, and I think every once in a while you get a paper strike report that's largely going online. So um, when I'm doing this presentation at, for new employees or just about anybody, the question often is, what do we report? You report all birds and all bats. Um, terrestrial animals, you only report those if they're about one kilogram, which is about 2.2 pounds. So uh, a small rodent on a runway or a, uh, a little reptile. I appreciate it when people do the diligence to report those, but that's actually not necessary. Uh, I try to mention, we always try to specify where the strike occurred or where the remains were found. And there was a time when the strike reports included the individual's name as well as their title and some contact information. Around 2019, I think the FAA stopped doing that because uh, they wanted to protect people's personal uh, identifying information. I'm, there's a little bit of a rumor mill on what happened, but I think somebody from the military, their uh, contact information got out and it just didn't go over very well. So that's a little bit about strike reports. Here's the sort of a screenshot of the online uh, strike report database. And just anyone can report a, a wildlife strike. We're gonna see a minute in a minute how the, the breakdown of sort of the genesis of these strike reports. But hypothetically, even a passenger could report a, a wildlife strike. That's about the only thing I have not seen happen yet. I think I've seen just about anybody with any imaginable job title or uh, function in the airport has reported a strike. And there's also a feature on here to where you can uh, search the database by airport and timeline and that kind of thing. It's all public record if you're ever curious of uh, what species are involved with uh, wildlife strikes. And then another really important aspect of our strike reporting is that um, it's all pretty cut and dry when you are doing a runway inspection as an airport operations employee and you find the remains of a uh, morning dove on the runway. Uh, the FAA says if you find remains on a runway, a taxiway, an active taxiway, or the safety margins around those structures that we have to assume that is a strike and report it accordingly. Now it gets a little bit more difficult when an aircraft um, rolls up to the gate and they know they struck a bird about a mile away. The pilot, of course, if you've ever been <laughs> from the pilot's vantage point, very limited uh, field of vision. And so essentially the, at this point, the only evidence of that strike is what's called snarge. That's a sort of a military term that's trickled its way down to industry. It basically just means feathers, tissues, or remnants of those things, or a little bit of like blood material. Uh, so we can collect that material, um, either uh, my group, the airport operations, uh, pilots can, or the gate uh, personnel, technicians, just about anybody can. And that goes off to the Smithsonian Feather ID Lab. They are very efficient. It's usually about a two week turnaround and they update the strike report, the online database, and that actually comes at no cost directly to the airport. A uh, very talented group of people. I think there's about six people that work there that may have changed. And so we send those off to DC and uh, they make the changes. So I mentioned uh, 2019 was the last year that we could sort of see a composition of who was reporting strikes. And I really liked having that data as well as the contact information to follow up with people. If I had any questions, if it just looked like something had been entered incorrectly, I could follow up and that was kind of handy. Unfortunately, that's gone away. But what you see here was pretty typical in most years. Our group, airside operations, would do about 70 to 75% of the strike reports. Pilots, uh, vast majority of those are commercial pilots, would do about 20 to 25% of the strike reports. There would always be a few that they chose not to enter any name, contact information, or affiliation, and those are always just a handful, a handful of strike reports that would kind of break down from there. So that's calendar year of 2019. We received 159 strike reports for Austin Burks from that year, excluding duplicate strike reports, uh, strike reports excluded on the basis of other criteria, like somebody uh, reporting something that wasn't relevant or it came out to be a 
insect strike or a weather strike or just someone kind of <laughs> didn't use the database as they were supposed to. So that was a pretty typical year, I think, uh, in terms of the reporting structure. So this is 2022 was interesting. We started to take a little bit of a different look at what kind of strikes we were getting. I tell people at some of the events I participate in that all strikes are not really created equal. Some are better substantiated than others. So what I termed as a type one strike is a strike is reported and evidence is collected. A pilot says they struck a bird on a on the runway, we responded, collected the remains, and it, you know it's a pretty close-knit kind of report. Or the evidence was collected from the aircraft itself, and we got a positive ID. Uh, strike two would be a report is submitted, but no evidence is ever collected. And you could think of the prototypical example would be an aircraft outbound for, let's say, Denver, uh, struck a bird about a mile or two away. We tried to sort of be responsible for about a five-mile radius of the airport. But if you strike a bird about two or three miles away en route to another location, we just have to hope that people at that airport are going to collect that data. If not, it's unfortunately going to somewhat fall through the cracks. Uh, type three is when a bird or a correction, a aircraft rolls up to the gate. We find evidence of a strike on the aircraft. But we don't really know when or where it occurred. We just collect that and make the report as best we can. And then type four, this is the majority of strike reports uh, last year it would be about 41 percent of strikes and that's just wild wildlife remains being found in or in whole or in part on the airport where there is reason to believe it was a result of a strike with aircraft uh, borrowing from the faa guidance document on that so that's sort of uh, how our strike reports broke down that year by one of those four types Here's a species composition. This might, might be interesting to y'all. Um, those of y'all are involved in bird watching and uh, monitoring and that kind of things. Most years, morning doves are the most common, frequently documented uh, species is involved in strikes. So that was the case for 2022. 2021, it was actually uh, barn swallows. There's always gonna be a lot of unknown species with or without a size descriptor, small, medium, large. Uh, barn swallows were up there that year. Uh, we found four cattle egrets. None of those were ever confirmed. Basically fit that type four category of remains found on a runway, presumed to be a strike with no other uh, evidence available. Um, let's see, anything unusual about that year? There's usually a crested cara, cara every year, usually a vulture every year, <laughs> not more than two or three of those. Um, but let's see, no, nothing else. Oh, black-bellied whistling ducks. We had an aircraft come in, I think about a mile or two away, had struck three of those all in one strike. It was uh, kind of a situation. I believe that also was an engine ingestion involved with that. And we had our first ever coyote strike that year too. Uh, just found a, a coyote on a runway right after a Delta flight departed. So that's all we were able to uh, find out about it. But that's uh, 149 documented strike reports. Uh, for that year. I'm correction, I'm sorry, 156 documented strike reports. Here's a, a trend of uh, 2004 to 2022, just in the uh, number of birds documented on strike reports. Of course, you'll have strike reports of a, a single single bird struck up to multiple birds. Uh, I think we've had a, a pilot estimate, you know, up to uh, 10 to 12. It's about the most I've ever seen. And here's a an area of good news, if you look at bird strikes as a function of every 10,000 flight operations, those flight operations would largely be arrivals, departures, but also includes touch and goes. If you think of sort of a pilot practicing their landing skills, it's something the military does a bunch, but uh, strikes per every 10,000 flight operations, it's actually a decreasing trend. We started at about uh, nine in 2018, and last year, I think we ended up with about 5.85 bird strikes per every uh, 10,000 flight operations. All right, gonna reach another little pivot point in the presentation here. So there's where the airport, airport is situated. Uh, some of what we are contending with in terms of bird strikes and keeping a safe operating environment here at the airport. What are our management strategies? And I largely uh, borrowed a lot of this from uh, training in St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis a few years ago. And there really is no single right answer. There's sort of a integration, yet also a prioritization of different wildlife management strategies. And organized most 
its most simplest form, you have habitat modification that has a lot of context to it, which I'm going to go into it here in a moment. Uh, exclusion, harassment, or hazing, capture, relocation, and finally uh, the lethal element of airport wildlife management. And I like to say, sort of as a atmosphere around that, uh, those different approaches. There's just detection, avoidance, awareness, whichever term you want to choose. Uh, sometimes uh, we see a lot of migratory activity in uh, October, for instance, and I'll say to the group I'm part of, uh, sometimes the best thing you can do is just get on the phone with the control tower and let them know and have them instruct pilots accordingly. Uh, I'm here only five days a week so i depend on uh, the rest of my group to let me know what kind of trends they're seeing where they're seeing birds accumulating so i can address those things when i'm into the office as well as any failures in the fence or gate system uh, we need to know that it's a priority information but then on to habitat modification so what does that mean well essentially it's the removing food shelter and water from the airport environment has a number of advantages in that it's a long-term solution. It's non-lethal, generally speaking, very little capital expense in that it uses existing personnel, equipment, uh, supplies. Uh, the disadvantage of it is that it's a constant maintenance effort required. I tell the uh, maintenance staff uh, here during the trainings that if they're on a mower, a weed eater, uh, doing brush removal, that <laughs> in a lot of ways they're doing far more wildlife management than I am from sort of a proactive standpoint. Uh, but there's also a public awareness aspect of it, of not feeding wildlife. You, you would be surprised how often you find somebody doing that, keeping uh, waste containers closed. Here's sort of an overview of those. Uh, removing standing water, correcting poor drainage issues on the airport, irrigation leaks. That's uh, We're in a dry environment, right? A dry, hot environment. So that's going to be an important aspect of it. Herbicide applications specifically targeted towards species that are known to attract birds and wildlife. And uh, any sort of planting as well as our installation projects typically come by our group to be evaluated to make sure that we're not going to essentially establish things that are going to be a food source or a roosting source for uh, birds. Uh, I should mention about 98% of strikes are birds and only really about 2% other. And then effective landscape maintenance and removing brush and not piling those things up where they could become uh, essentially habitat, right? Vegetation management, there's a lot of guidance documents out there on this. Some of them I see a little bit differently from what's on paper, but as a technical matter, the FAA uh, regulations state that grass should be maintained at about a 6 to 12 inch uh, height range. If it's too short, birds feel comfortable congregating. If it's too tall, uh, then you're going to get more your uh, mammals and reptiles using that area's habitat. And the worst thing you can have would be an interspaced tall grass and uh, short grass kind of environment, right? Um, so that's sort of the science behind that. Uh, we also try to prevent the high risk species from from forming, we have a uh, database of which ones are most priority. So we try to stay on top of the mowing. And then even bare areas where there's sand, gravel, or grit, as you know, doves, pigeons, they'll uh, pick that material up for their digestion process. So really kind of everything attracts uh, something. It's just really a matter of optimizing to reduce risk. And then another element of habitat modification is food source management. And this is a little bit of sort of a housekeeping issue, keeping uh, waste containers closed or instructing tenants to do that, preventing the wildlife feeding, removing trash and litter. Uh, whenever there's a strike, we try to remove the remains from that strike for a couple of reasons. One is to get them off the runway where they're essentially fod, or ob I call it bio fod, uh, for an object and debris. Uh, but also that would attract vultures, right? Or other scavengers. So that's another reason we try to remove it. And then of course there's the strike reporting aspect where we want to identify that species, submit the strike report. Securing and uh, restricting abandoned buildings. There are a number of those here. The airport has a, a history of a military base before it was an airport. Controlling access to vent systems, storm drainage lines, all that kind of thing falls under habitat modification. Moving on to exclusion, uh, fences and gates. That's going to be your really main defense against uh, wildlife encroachment onto the airport. That is an asset we have a lot of money invested into, but uh, I do tell people our, our fences and gates a lot of times were never really built from a wildlife management standpoint, more often for other things. Uh, the FAA mandates that uh, all closures and the fence and the gates have to be within certain tolerance, so we have to inspect for that quite a bit. And then with uh, a lot of the wildlife we have out here, there's just 
pretty frequent what I call dig throughs uh, where wildlife digs under a fence. We have to address that. And as we're building new fence, we are coming back with skirting or other kind of barrier to prevent that kind of thing. Now these, you might see them shopping malls and other locations. To some extent they work, to some extent they don't, but that's bird strikes, bird netting. Uh, out in the western part of the U.S. where water is uh, even more limited. You can see these floating plastic balls on top of a reservoir or water catchment feature to prevent your uh, birds from accessing that congregating there. I don't know if I've seen this other object in practice, but it would kind of blow in the wind and keep birds from <laughs> perching on a, on a ledge or something like that. Then there's coiled wire, straight wire, uh, electrified or non-electrified, a number of different repellents. We don't use those as much. Uh, and then you have your sort of marketed chemical repellents. And I'm not really familiar with these or the active ingredients. I think we used to use like some grapes, grapeseed oil on some ledges to a uh, sort of a mixed effectiveness on that. And just to close out mention for these, if you take some of the training tours of airports, you'll, you'll see people trying these things. If they work, I guess it's a great, cheap, uh, readily available solution. Anything that's reflective, uh, some of your scare type effigies or uh, things of that nature. I don't know. I think a lot of them sort of need reinforcement to be effective. And otherwise, uh, wildlife tends to kind of settle in and is unperturbed by it. And then there's uh, sort of taking that up to a little bit of a different level with effigies. These are, I think, some of the way you might hear described is uh, birds in a stress posture. Now, this has uh, somewhat bad public relations written all over it. So it's not something we really do here at the airport. And I suppose they've started making these uh, sort of plastic molded replicas of pigeons and gulls. Uh, I have noticed pigeon gulls and vultures, if they see one of their own uh, dead, they do tend to actually, that tends to be effective. They move on. Some other species, not so much. But that's also another sort of repelling technique you could use. And then there's also pyrotechnics. Now, uh, there's a number of different ones out there. You can invest in these things to different levels. Uh, they are effective, they are labor intensive, and they do require training. And some of these things could start a fire or uh, potentially get, you know, be uh, unsafe to fire around aircraft and that kind of thing. We have had a lot of success with our uh, propane cannons. Those have worked real well. And we do have uh, different handheld pyrotechnics and of course different uh, there's screamers and bangers and different ones, and they work for uh, different species. And uh, just in the spirit of kind of mentioning everything, here's some other uh, tactics you'll see. Flashing or strobe lights, lasers, those are things you have to be careful with in an airport environment, especially out in the open, inside a hangar, you know, that might work a little bit better. Water cannons, uh, no real familiar with that. Falconry can work real well. It's uh, very effective but uh, also very expensive. You have to, I think there's only so many people out there that really practice that. And some air airports will also use dogs to essentially run, run off of flocks of birds from the safety areas around the runway and other areas too. And then moving, uh, moving along, uh, trapping, trapping removal. Uh, there's, that's of course another set of safety considerations you have to take into mind. And uh, it's also labor intensive. There's a lot of regulation on what you can trap and then what you have to do with it once you have trapped it. Uh, so we have a pretty good working relationship with City of Austin Animal Services when it comes to our domestic animals. Some of the other things can be relocated and some cannot. Um, in reality though, it's hard to sort of trap everything. Uh, some of the research backs that up, you just really don't uh, tend to trap the entirety of a population ever. <laughs> and then there's a uh, lethal removal. Now this one gets a little bit of a bad rap, but to, to steal the words of uh, the individual that trained some of us at St. Paul, Minneapolis years back, if you don't have a lethal removal to your wildlife control program, then you don't really have a wildlife control program was the way he stated it. Uh, this is an effective species specific means of controlling hazardous wildlife around the airport. There's of course, uh, public image and safety issues. We're fortunate here that we have large margins of uh, zones around the airport where there's no businesses or homes operating. So that's, that's definitely helpful. Uh, there's specific training that has to go into that. And then everything we do as far as lethal removal of uh, migratory species has to be documented and submitted in a permit to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And we actually go way beyond what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife permit specifies. We get 
most often we get a GPS point for every uh, lethal removal action that we take. A, uh, a, sometimes we'll use the uh, pigeons and doves, we'll do a dissection that will find out what they're feeding on, what the attractant is for those species, and that go, all goes into a database that we oper that operate that goes above and beyond what um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife specifies that we're supposed to do. Okay, as we sort of bring this to a summary here, all the wildlife management actions we take here at the airport, the uh, really the entire program is all outlined in what's called the Wildlife Hazard Management Plan. That's a, a living document. It's supposed to be reviewed every year with facts and figures or any new dimensions to what we want to do. Uh, we can add that to the Wildlife Hazard Plan. It has to go to the FAA for approval, and then essentially it becomes a fair operating procedure. Ours is about 80 pages. I would, I think, ultimately like to streamline it so that people would be maybe a little more likely to read the whole thing. But um, it outlines a number of different things, such as the authorities, their responsibilities in the Wildlife Hazard Management Plan, all relative uh, permits and regulations that we have to abide by, safety procedures, of course, included that in that the wildlife control procedures themselves, as well as uh, evaluation and training program. So that's uh, every airport has a, uh, that operates at the level Austin Bergstrom does has a wildlife hazard management plan. And that's something that uh, we can always refer to. It's uh, available to anybody that wants it. And that really brings everything I had to present here to a summary. I'm sure on the uh, technical aspects of ecology and behavior, uh, talking to Audubon, y'all probably know a little bit more than me. I have in most cases, I'm probably sure I actually know a lot more than me. I have actually never really had a official ornithology coursework in college. I was uh, just kind of did a general all-purpose environmental degree and uh, was in stormwater, uh, the world of stormwater water quality before I sort of found my way into to the uh, wildlife uh, airport wildlife management. So that sort of summarizes everything I have here. If there's any technical questions, uh, my email is on here. My office phone is on here. I'd be happy to follow up. Uh, I think y'all are going to have me go into questions at this point, but that's uh, brings to closure everything I had to present. Uh, yes, it is now the question portion. Thank you uh, so much, Chris, for uh, this informative uh, presentation. We do have uh, some questions here. Uh, sure. uh, uh, Kaylee, I don't know on the Google sheet, um, my power, okay, I see some more questions there. My power went off for a little bit, so I had to hop, hop got bumped off and had to hop off, back on, but I don't know if I got all the questions, but uh, there was a question, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, early on, you know, because obviously you deal mm -hmm. with not just birds, but a lot of different wildlife, and I guess what, you know, all jokes aside about the movie uh, Snakes on a Plane, how are reptiles <laughs> involved with, with uh, um, you know, aircraft issues. The question was specifically how are reptiles involved with aircraft yeah. issues? Uh, not over, not overly common to get calls on that. I think in the time I've been here, coming up on five years now, there's been one official strike report with uh, a reptile. It was a prairie rat snake, I think it was, just found on a runway. Uh, I think that might be the only official reptile related strike report here at Austin Bergstrom. We have kind of a joke uh, when it comes to airport job descriptions on um, other duties as assigned, right? Uh, the other things you get called into. Um, a lot of bees. We get a lot of calls for bees, uh, especially, actually, especially about this time of year. I've had about two, two this year, but there's been uh, other years where April or May, we get a lot of calls. Uh, bees congregating on jet bridges, irrigation boxes, electrical control panels, uh, the cones they use to uh, mark the wings of an aircraft, belt loaders, the sort of drivable conveyor belts they use to load uh, luggage up to an aircraft, bee congregations on that, so we deal with those, as well as bats. Uh, we have actually two colonies of bats here on the airport that has been here as long as anyone really knows. And so we do have a number of bat strikes every year. Uh, just about all those fall into that, uh, what I call that category of remains found on a runway presumed to be a strike. So reptiles, not often. A lot of times it's just usually a, a snake that's got into the terminal. One year there was, a, a, I think best as we can figure, a snake wrapped itself around a wheelchair. Somebody rode the wheelchair back into the uh, 
back into the terminal and then the snake jumped off and had to, had to get it. So things like that, the little oddball situation, odd, odd situations you see, but uh, no, I don't think there's ever been any substantial reptile strikes on an, on an aircraft okay. at, at our airport. So uh, another question is, you know, what is, uh, and this is specific to Austin Bergstrom, uh, what's the rarest or most unusual bird species that's been struck uh, at uh, Austin Bergstrom? Oh, a number of them over the year. I had a bald eagle strike on November 25th of 2019, I think it was, uh, an outbound aircraft. Yeah, we actually recovered the remains. U.S. Fish and Wildlife came and picked them up. Uh, appeared to be maybe a two to three year old bald eagle uh, north end of the west runway. Uh, one, another odd one that actually got the attention of Smithsonian Feather ID Lab, where they actually called us, was we found the remains of a American oyster catcher uh, on the runway or near the runway. We sent them in for ID, and I guess that's a bird that really should not, as far as the habitat maps show, really shouldn't be anywhere near here. So that was kind of odd. We're seeing an increase in presence of black-bellied whistling ducks. I think we've had one bank swallow strike, one indigo bunting strike, but uh, kind of breaks down from there. We tend to see sort of morning dove, barn swallow, and uh, sort of drops off at that point. Um, kind of related to the morning dove, uh, someone earlier had asked, was, they thought it was unusual that uh, there was no white-winged dove strikes. Because um, you know, white-winged doves are super co common, more abundant than morning doves in a lot of places around town. Yes, that does seem to be the case in my neighborhood. I know I see far more white-winged dove. I have noticed just observationally that the white-winged doves tend to be on the west side of the airport, and the morning doves tend to be just about everywhere else. Uh, there, there has historically been just trying to go by memory, maybe five or six documented white winged dove strikes in the time I've been here, 2018 to present. Uh, but you're right, they're far less common. We don't see as many. The number of times I can, I can say I've observed a white winged dove within uh, what I've called the airport operations area, very limited. It's, it's pretty much all morning doves out here. All right. We have uh, another question of, uh, have you ever had birds try to build nests at the airport? or what kind of nesting bird issues? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, well, in the garages, uh, they're starting to build garages a lot more with uh, bird nesting and roosting in mind. So if y'all have been to the airport recently, you've seen the blue garage, it's constructed real well. There's very few ledges or areas that a bird would wanna nest in. Now, if you look at the old red garage, uh, it's uh, major pigeons gray tail grackles, Eurasian collared doves, occasionally, well, even more than a few morning doves uh, are all in there. Some of the abandoned buildings around here we find, as well as there was a old golf course dating back to the military days and some structures there are kind of a common place for uh, vultures to uh, form nests. And I find quite a few Western kingbird nests, uh, so anywhere where there's like kind of wiring or uh, Oh, generally like 15, 20 foot off the ground around the AOA, I find, I do find their nests. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of vegetated area out here. So if, if you're looking for a nest, you could, you can probably find it. Uh, as well as all the, the frontage of the airport, if you've ever been through the passenger pickup or drop off lanes, a lot of nesting down there too, that, uh, that just tends to attract a lot of grackles and European startlings and such. So, okay. Uh, so another question we had uh, is the, the rising trend in strikes because of a rising number of airplanes. Yes. Uh, short answer, yes. That's certainly a factor. Uh, from some of the other research I've seen, it's just that conservation, uh, conservation efforts are being successful. So more birds um, sort of operating in the same space that aircraft will, right? And then... Uh, Generally, we tend to see our highest strikes around August and September here when sort of the nesting season is over, as you might figure. But it's uh, more air travel for sure is a factor. 
conservation efforts paying off. Probably, I tend to think urbanization, just with uh, populations expanding. Uh, my prior position at this was in Dallas, and that airport, from an aerial view, almost looked like Central Park, urbanized all around it, and the airport was what, essentially, what little green space there was. So airports themselves can can somewhat be attractive to birds too, uh, as the area around tends to urbanize. That that becomes a uh, maybe a more attractive habitat habitat in a sense, right? But I think those are some of the main main trends you're seeing towards that strike data. Okay. Uh, so we have a comment and a question here. So at the old Mueller Airport in Austin, I guess it had a fairly large population of black-tailed jackrabbits, which was unusual uh, for the county, uh, this part of the county. And it was common to see them adjacent to the runway. Uh, so this person was just curious if there was any species, whether it be mammal, bird, anything else uh, that you consider to be more numerous at, at uh, Austin Bergstrom than maybe in the surrounding area. Maybe it's hmm. not something that's particularly attracted to the airport. Yeah, I got a little bit of a, of a two-part answer to that. Uh, this is prior to my time, but I was told there was a lot of black-tailed jackrabbits here and the military in combination with USDA, I think just kind of took them out. <laughs> uh, they removed them. Uh, let's see, what do we see a lot of? Um, a lot of rattlesnakes, particularly on the west side of the airport, uh, diamondback rattlesnakes. They don't come in the fence too much. Uh, a lot of grackles. Of course, that's not inconsistent with what you see at some of the shopping areas around here and that kind of thing. Uh, this time of year, in fact, even today, I'm uh, seeing a lot of upland sandpiper. Uh, they'll be here. There tends to be sort of a, a transition in around March where we see the American kestrels are uh, less numerous, and then you see your western kingbirds and your scissor tail flycatchers come in, and then your uh, upland sandpipers tend to follow right around that time. Uh, yeah, you know, nothing strikes me as overly inconsistent with what you see in the surrounding environment here. Uh, since starting here, I've, I'm just surprised how many vultures there are. And uh, there was some speculation that that was tied to the landfill years back, kind of around 2018, 2019. I do inspections of the landfill and just we have not really seen a correlation there with the surveys we do at the landfill. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's kind of a roundabout answer to that. There was, there was that rabbit population years back. A lot of skunks. I will say that if you come in at night, you see them just about everywhere. Okay. But I think kind of your typical urban wildlife, there's a lot of gray foxes. They use the storm drains. I almost consider them beneficial um, that they're keeping the rodent population down. But if you put a uh, wildlife motion back, motion activated wildlife cameras out at night, it's a different world out here. A lot of foxes and skunks and things like that. Okay. Uh, so in terms of your depredation permit, uh, someone had a question about, you know, terms of your permit, is it open-ended or do you have a certain limit uh, that you're allowed to take uh, with that permit? Um, and then kind of the second part of that question is, um, you know, there are certain species like pigeons and starlings that aren't actually protected, uh, but do you still have to report on those and document them? That's a great question. I'm glad that was asked because I think I sort of skipped over it. So we do have a limit. Uh, I think it's 600 on our migratory, migratory bird take. And I will mention that we don't come anywhere close to that. Uh, in fact, every year I've been here, it's been uh, the lethal element of management has been uh, drastically reduced. Uh, and this year we're headed kind of for an all time low on that. As far as what we are actually taking, the top species tend to be great tail grackles. Uh, that is actually a uh, migratory bird uh, here, so it's on our permit. Uh, pigeons and a lot of European starlings, and then it kind of breaks down from there. We do get large flocks of Franklin gulls uh, following storm events, uh, really right around now, April, May, and um, that's one of those ones we I've I've seen about. No exaggeration, maybe 200 of them sit down on the runway or right, ar right around the runway, uh, which is, you know, a uh, high, high risk factor. Gold, the FAA actually rates which birds are 
the most hazardous to aviation. Uh, vultures are number one. Gulls are certainly way up there. So in those instances where the where uh, flocks of uh, Franklin gulls fly in, if we find we can like lethally remove two or three, we can effectively displace the flock of few hundred plus. Um, so it's sort of just a worthwhile risk management procedure in that case. Uh, was there another part to that question I haven't answered? So no, that, we are, was that, that got, oh, no, got it. I think that, that about covers it. Um, so another question was, um, I guess aircraft can't swerve to avoid those big flocks. I guess they have no real way of telling what's out there in front of them at that scale. <laughs> there is some aircraft uh, detection in radar systems. We don't, we don't have one here. Uh, you know, that's a little bit above my head. I have no pilot experience, uh, but you know what? More strikes on approach as opposed to departure because the aircraft is operating in sort of a lower noise volume, if I can just say it that way, uh, flying a flatter trajectory for a longer duration of time. So we have to have more, more strikes on arrivals than on departures. On departure, the aircraft is basically just trying to uh, make altitude as quick as possible, right? I think, you know, you start talking large commercial aircraft, I think evasive maneuvers are, are kind of difficult. <laughs> you know, I'm not the expert, not the authority on that, but I think it's kind of difficult. Uh, I also, for the record, think the majority of strikes are underreported. Uh, you know, if a pilot doesn't find it or if uh, the ground crew is in a hurry and don't take time to report the evidence of a, of a strike on an aircraft. So you just simply don't know what you don't know, but I tend to suspect to if we did know that uh, aircraft bird strikes are probably underreported. Um, yeah, you'd have to probably talk to a pilot on the, <laughs> the close call. Ass oh, every once in a while, we get a strike report of a, of a, of a near miss, which that, those go into that category of, uh, of not counting in our strike totals, of course. But So yeah, I think that might be as best I could answer that. Okay. We had a question, I guess, in terms of... Uh kind of the lethal rem removal uh, uh, this question relates to are public hunters allowed to take from Austin Bergstrom property but I guess none of the none of the species mm -hmm. there would really be game species you're talking about oh it would just be your morning doves really uh, no it's it's a very controlled thing um, in fact there's a there's a credential you have to have on your your access badge to carry weapons here. And uh, I'm as far in our work room, I'm the only one that of course, you know, law enforcement will have that. So uh, I manage the permit. There's no other lethal take uh, besides myself. Uh, USDA acts in a sort of a consulting role with us and they've helped us remove some flocks of uh, blackbirds and things, uh, you know, specifically great tail grackles and things in the past, but that's about it. Uh, uh, as far as the wildlife program, that's the extent of the lethal removal aspect of it. Okay. So uh, this question, is there any evidence birds are flying higher or getting struck higher due to warmer air caused by climate change? Oh, no, I don't think I can really speak to that question. Uh, there is an element on the strike report forms of the altitude that the strike occurred at, it often just gets blank. It's one of the more, and it's better to have a somewhat incomplete strike report than it is to just disregard the event. Uh, I haven't been looking at that as close. There was a, there was a couple of years where we were looking uh, at strikes relative distance to the airport. And that would of course sort of coincide with, with altitude, but no, I don't think I can really answer to the technical nature of that. Um, so right. I'm not, I'm not sure you might have to uh, go to some of the other research out there. So just a few more, I guess, final questions before we wrap up. Um, and, you know, just kind of generally, how does uh, strikes at Austin Bergstrom compare to other central Texas airports? Are they kind of the same species or, you know, are there big, you know, big differences and, you know, what, species might be causing the problems? I think it's pretty consistent. Uh, as I mentioned when I was showing the online FAA strike report forms that anyone can go on there and create a search for uh, any given airport. And so I think if you were to look at uh, San Antonio or let's say Dallas Love Field, we sort of operate similar 
to them in terms of flight volume to Dallas Love Field, I think you would find real a lot of consistency. I know we're all sort of in the same flyway. Uh, DFW, um, <clears throat> that's uh, they have a very robust wildlife program at that airport. It's also, of course, a very major airport. And so I think they see a lot of the the same numbers we see, just of course higher because they operate so much more flight volume. I think generally speaking, it's it's pretty consistent with what you'd see uh, see at other airports, though. Uh, morning doves, I, I've I may have mentioned, I think tends to be the number one struck bird across the entire southern U.S. Uh, if you start going up north, you'll see those compositions start to change a little bit. Okay. So last question. Um, so. You mentioned the case of all the Franklin's gulls on the ground uh, uh, on the runway. Uh, so, you know, do you, how do you deal with that? Do you look for kind of a gap between incoming and outgoing planes to scare them away or, you know, you know, kind of move traffic, air traffic around it on the runways? How do you, how would you deal with that kind of specific situation? Yeah, real good question. So uh, we have to operate in a safe manner at the airport, uh, getting onto a taxiway or a runway requires coordination with the control tower. So typically, speaking specifically to that example of, of Franklin Goals uh, setting, setting down on the runway or right along the margins of the runway, uh, my, usually myself and at least two other airside operations vehicles will go out there, try to do the uh, hazing or displacement on those. It just has historically not worked real well. Uh, everything from flashing lights to sirens to ele elevating the pressure up to pyrotechnics just doesn't tend to work on the Franklin goals. So we'll, we will wait for a break between flights, get clearance from the control tower, go out there, uh, do what we have to do as far as the taking of one or two or three, usually not much more than that at a time. And then the flock just tends to move off. Well, they tend to, to sort of fly around it about twice, and then they then they move on to another location. I've noticed a lot of the times they're going towards Hornsby Bend, so I assume that's sort of a another area they gravitate towards. But yeah, it's a it's a lot of coordinated effort. There is a lot of uh, in incoming traffic at about any given time. You have to know you know, what uh, direction aircraft is, uh, is approaching from, you're on your radio. It's a, it's a lot of things sort of taken at once, but there's definitely a coordination there with the emphasis on safety. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. Gonna Thanks, absolutely. Pass it, I appreciate pass it to you Nicole. All. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much, Chris. This is really an informative talk and I, I learned a lot. So thanks everybody for being here tonight. We hope to see you next Thursday at our Birdathon party. Hope to see you soon. Everybody take care. Enjoy some Maybe enjoy some birds after this storm tonight. For sure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good night. Good night.